Bruchem Aboim. Again, welcome to our home, and again, thank you for attending. Um, this week on my thoughts, I would like to examine the act of apologizing. Saying to someone that you were sorry for something that you said or did. You know, the question arises, is the act of apologizing limited to words, or does it involve our body's language? Now, words can be both constructive and destructive. When one offers an apology, you know, the words that they choose can make the difference as to whether their apology will be accepted or not. We witness in the Torah with the sin of the spies that they apologized to God. You know, but somehow their apology was not accepted. Whereas with the sin of the golden calf, which can be seen as a much more grievous transgression, God did accept their apology. So the question becomes, what was the difference? We read in the portion of Kisisa with the sin of the golden calf that says there, when the children of Israel heard the bad news, the people began to mourn, in addition to the fact that they stopped wearing their jewelry. The Talmud in the Tractate of Shabbat states that the jewelry that they are referring to here denotes the spiritual gifts that the children of Israel merited at Mount Sinai when they accepted the Torah. We also read in the Torah in the portion of Shalach, when the nation sinned with the incident of the spies in the second year of their journey in the desert. This occurred shortly before the nation were scheduled to enter the land. Somehow the reaction was not the same. In the portion of Shalach where it states that they cried in their tents, it states that Moshe related God's words to the children of Israel. Well, they replied in the portion of Shalach with the words, Asher Omar Hashem ki chatanu. Uh, that God said that we have sinned. God said. Hmm. However, the nation did not truly perceive that they had sinned. But they said, if God felt that they had sinned, well, guess what? Then they would accept his opinion. So we witnessed two different scenarios. In both cases, they apologized. Now, the first was accepted, yet the second was not. The difference between the two apology, excuse me, was that the first was sincere, was a sincere recognition of their transgression, which was then followed by an action. They removed the jewelry that they had received when they accepted the Torah on Mount Sinai. Whereas with the sin of the spies, they apologized only because God said that they had sinned on their own. They really didn't see it the same way. The negative report of the spies took away what little confidence the nation possessed. It was not that they didn't believe in God. No, they, they, in reality, they didn't believe in themselves. They didn't feel that they were worthy of God's assistance. And then, even when they regretted their initial reaction and decided to enter the land, it, was, it too was an action that went against God's command. He had said to not go out to battle. Sincerity is the key to a proper apology. However, it must consist of an agreement of both word and body. If your words are spoken properly, but your body language tells a different story, well, then your apology is unacceptable. We read in the Torah in the portion of Vayera, where it states that when Sari Menu, Sarah, our mother, heard the angel say to Avram Avinu that your father, pardon me, that your wife Sarah will have a son, in verse 12 it states, Vayitzchak Sarah Bekirba, and Sarah laughed to herself, saying, my husband is old. Since she didn't actually articulate her thought into words, when she was confronted by Avram about her negative reaction, she denied his accusation. She said, I didn't laugh. Sari Meno, Sarah's mother, is one of the most righteous women that ever lived. How could she lie? The answer is that in her mind, she wasn't lying. After all, she really never said anything. True, she didn't express her feelings into words. As it states, her reaction was bekirba in her mind. Her disbelief to the blessing was expressed not in word, but in body language. And we see that she, considered, she was considered culpable, just as if she had spoken the words out loud. If you think about it, one could say that your body language is the harmony to the melody, which is your words. Many times you will hear them, someone say, you know, it wasn't necessarily what you said, it was how you said it. Body expression has many tools. 
your face, your posture, a smile, a frown, or a smirk. And there's a sigh, a groan, a giggle, a whisper, or even a shout. Then there are the eyes, the windows of the soul. I personally love the eyes up. Then there is the eyes up and roll, eyes wide-eyed, closed eyes. Then there are, of course, tears and laughter. They are on top of the, both the positive and the negative side. We also talk with our hands, especially if you're Jewish. We do this with gestures and even bodies by turning your head or your body away from the person you're communicating with. Not just bodily reactions, even the tone of your voice, many times, tell others what you're really thinking. You know, we communicate our inner feelings in many different ways. Many of us go through life with what we call a poker face. People can read our cards just by the look on our face. We don't see ourselves. It's not like we stand in front of a mirror when we speak. We may have a mental image of what we perceive that our body is expressing. However, what we think and what reality is hmm, are many times different. Much like Sari Meno, Sari, our mother. Again, she was mo one of the most righteous individuals that ever lived. She was so holy that the tabernacle and the temples were both all fashioned in some ways after her tent. The candles that she lit every week were never extinguished, which was comparable to the Ner Maravi, the western light that burnt in the tabernacle and temple. It had to be extinguished daily before it could be relit in both the tabernacle and the temple. The bread that she baked would remain fresh from week to week. So too in the tabernacle and temples. The 12 showbreads that were kept on the golden ta table in the sanctuary from week to week. When they were replaced by the new loaves, the old loaves were still warm and fresh. Her tent was always covered with a cloud that hovered above it. And so too, there was a cloud that covered over the tabernacle in the desert for 38 years. So from Sarah, we can witness that unless a person actually articulates their thoughts, well, they don't necessarily feel they have any culpability. However, the saying goes that many times actions speak louder than words. You are culpable not only for your words, you are also culpable for your bodily reactions. In reality, our thoughts are who we really are, and our words are who we think that we should be. The truth is that most of us are bad actors. Somehow our negative thoughts are exhibited through our body language, though we may try to disguise our inner feelings with our words. I think that many times when we offer an apology, we feel the necessity to inform the other person of all the positive thoughts that we entertain before we screwed it up. When we offer excuses for our mistakes, all we are doing in reality is putting more wood on the fire. If any of our excuses were valid, then we wouldn't feel a necessity to apologize. It's like giving someone a club to beat you with. The only thing one should say if they are apologizing is, I'm truly sorry. We learned this lesson from David Amela, King David. We read in the prophets in Samuel, Samuel 2, chapter 12, with the incident of David Amela and Bathsheba. Nasan Anavi, Nathan the prophet, approaches the king with a scenario. He tells the king about a rich man who owned many sheep. He was having friends over and he told his servant to go to the house of a certain poor tenant and to take his one and only sheep and serve it at his party. Huh. When David heard, David heard the story, he was incensed. He said to, to Nussan, the rich man should be put to death. The prophet then said to the king hmm, that the rich man in the story was David himself. He compared the fact that David took Bathsheba from her husband as comparable to the rich man taking the poor tenant's only sheep. David understood what the prophet was alluding to, and he admitted his guilt. Now, in reality, he had valid reasons that he could have offered. Instead, he only said one word, Chatasi, I have sinned. That's it, nothing else. You know, we witness a similar reaction in Torah with, in, in the portion of Balak. In the story of Bilaam, the prophet of the nations, where he was confronted by an angel on the road with a fiery sword, the angel reprimanded Bilaam for striking his donkey three separate times. When Bilaam responded to the angel's chastisement, all he said was, Chotosi, 
I have sinned, nothing more. His reply saved his life. Had he tried to offer any excuses, well, they may have well cost him his life. We witness in the portion of Vayishlach, where Yaakov and Esav meet. The last time that they saw each other was after Yaakov had taken Esav's blessings. Due to that incident, Yaakov was compelled to leave home under the cover of night for fear of his brother's anger. Now, they were about to meet for the first time after a separation of 34 years. Yaakov wasn't quite sure what to expect. After all, he had, re he, had, he had reason to be concerned, especially since he was told that his brother was coming to meet him with an army of 400 armed men. So Yaakov prepared for his upcoming encounter with his brother Esau with both prayer and war. But in addition, he analyzed the situation. He imagined what were the issues that his older brother still may have entertained. And as a gesture of peace, he sent Asa 550 livestock as a gift to his brother. He sent each herd individually, one followed shortly behind the other. He had even instructed his messengers to say when asked questions about the gifts that they presented to Asa, that they should reply, it belongs to your servant Yaakov. It then continues in the states that Yaakov thought to himself, hopefully he will forgive me. Then when the two brothers actually met, Yaakov approaches his older brother by bowing seven times. It was the respect that Yaakov exhibited more than the gifts that influenced Esau. Reading the portion, it even told Yaakov to keep his gifts. Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Let what is yours remain yours. What we can witness is rather than battle with each other, the two brothers hug and kiss each other. Yaakov's well-thought-out apology served his purpose. Peace was restored. It is important that we understand what some of the issues are so that we can hopefully confront and correct them, so to speak, the swing and then the follow-through. All of us make mistakes in life. After all, we are all human. As it states in the story of Faust, written by Johann Wolfgang Goethe, one of the most famous German authors. In the st it is the story of a man who sells his soul to the devil. In the book he writes that as long as a man lives, he will err. So we see that sinning, sinning is part and parcel of life. The challenge that we all face in life is, what do we do after we sin? Do we try to make amends or do we try to make excuses? both to man and to God. You know, few of us want to err intentionally, especially by hurting another person in the process. But invariably, well, we do. When we apologize for our errors, we need to do so in a way that emphasizes the fact that we realize that we have hurt someone. When we offer our apology, it should express our recognition and sincere remorse over our error in judgment. You know, some people find it difficult to apologize. Well, more often than not, ego is the obstacle that stands in the way of any apology. They tell a story about a young married chassid. He went to his rebbe and said that he had had a disagreement with his wife. And he asked the rebbe, should he apologize? The rebbe said, yes, that he should. The chassid then said, but rebbe, I want you to know that I was right. The Rebbe turned to him with a smile and said, well, then you should apologize even quicker. How do we apologize to God for all of the transgressions that we perform on a daily basis? Prayer, of course, is about praise and gratitude to God Almighty for all the goodness that he bestows upon us. But it is also about apologizing, admitting that we have sinned and asking God our Father in Heaven to forgive us once again. The question that we should address is, are our words sincere or are we just parroting them? After all, we pray the same prayers day after day, year after year. We use the same book. In fact, we all pray the same prayers daily. For most of us, though, we also commit the same sins daily. Where do our prayers originate from? Are we praying from our hearts or are we praying from our lips? Is it a race to the finish or is it an opportunity to connect? with our Father in Heaven. Prayer is meditation in its highest form. There is a famous saying that is attributed to our sages. 
that words from the heart enter into the heart. Praying to God Almighty, our Father in Heaven, is not the same as dealing with people. He is always in attendance. He is always eager to listen to all that we sincerely want to tell Him. He is quick to forgive and also to give inspiration to those who want to listen. His concern is not with our sins. Well, he knows that we will sin. That is a certainty. His question is, will we grow? Will we follow in the path that he has outlined for us in his Torah? Or are we content to wander through life following our own wants and desires? If we, are at, least, if we at least make an attempt to truly follow his advice, the results that we'll experience will make the challenge worthwhile. You know, God doesn't expect us to change all of our challenges in life in an instant. But he does expect us to at least make a sincere effort to be better each day, better than we were the day before. Life's not a sprint. It's a marathon. He just wants to know that we care and that we are aware of our imperfections. He expects us to put in the effort. So let us all apologize to God for all of our misdeeds and thank him for all of his patience. As the states in Pirkeovos, the ethics of the fathers, Rick Tarfin said, it is not incumbent upon you to complete the task, yet you are not free to desist from it either. And with that, we will also become more sensitive to the feelings of those around us. And if we hurt them in any way, we will have the strength and character to just say, Chotosi, I'm sorry. And with that, let us apologize to God Almighty for all of our transgressions. And in that merit, may he protect all of our brethren throughout the world, especially in the land of Israel. May he bring home all the hostages, heal all the injured, comfort all the mourners. May he safely return all of our brave soldiers with the coming of Mashiach Sukkanah, quickly now. Again, thank you very much for listening. And um, again, let's hope and pray that God helps our brethren and protects all of all Jews all over. Again, pray for them. If you can donate, do that. I'm not sure if it makes a difference, but if you would push the like button, uh, if you're looking on uh, YouTube, it seems to make a difference. Uh, as long as you listen, makes, that's all the thing for me, but it may make a difference to them. So if you can, please push the like button. And uh, again, look forward to... Uh, that. By the way, next week... Um, you get a week off. You've done so well. I will be at a wedding in New York. So I'll be taking off next week. Uh, after this class, there will be a musical rendition, again, of an original song that I've written. Uh, if you can, please stand by and listen to it. Thank you so very much for attending. God bless. Be well. Shabbat Shalom. God should protect you and be you safe. Thank you.